We're going to begin a, a new series. It's a four-week series, and uh, the name of the series is What's My Purpose? And this is probably one of the most frequently frequent questions I get asked, especially from young people, is what's my, how do I know my purpose? How do I know why I'm here? And so I'm not going to answer that for you today, and I'm not even going to answer it for you during the four-week series, <laughs> because only God can answer that for you. But I'm going to give you some things that God wants to do in your life so that you can find out what your purpose is. And I want to make a statement about your purpose, uh, and that is your purpose, I put this on the screen, is not made up, it's prayed down. So you don't make up or come up with, other, with whatever your purpose is, you pray it down. And this is a great time because in this series, this weekend we're starting our 21 days of prayer and fasting. And I, I say this every year, I'm asking you just to fast however the Lord leads you. You know, I had uh, one uh, person say to me, I'm going to fast uh, the internet for 21 days. Some of you just thought, oh, no, I'd, I'd, I'd rather fast all food. But, um, but just something, a fast, the reason we do a fast is it reminds us that we are consecrating that time to the Lord and to push into the Lord. So I, I really want you to pray about and come up with something you could fast. Could be just be desserts, and that could be a, a sacrifice for you. But something. We're also beginning this weekend our devotional. So 21 days of devotion, all right? And so I want you to think about that as well. Um, and then I'm grateful that we're celebrating this weekend Martin Luther King Day as we prayed at all of our campuses a moment ago. And that's something, that sh to me, it's amazing we're starting this weekend. That should be something that's always on our prayer list is for unity in the body of Christ and unity in our nation. So we can pray about that. All right, so this series about what's my purpose, um, back in the spring, I heard my daughter Elaine preach a message on David at, at Gateway Houston, and I called her and said, I want you to preach that at Gateway, and we set it up for November. And then in the summer, during my study break, is when the Lord gave me parts of this series and told me to preach this uh, and it would start in October. And what I didn't realize was that she was going to come at the end of the series, and, and she had four points about David. The field, uh, the palace, the throne, uh, the field, the palace, the battle, and then the throne. Those four points actually go along with the four messages in the series. It's like the Holy Spirit planned it out. So you could go back and listen to that message if you didn't get to hear it. But I'm going to come about this from a little different perspective and that is I'm going to take you back to the very beginning of Gateway Church. And that's not the first uh, service that we ever had. That's the prayer center that uh, was at Shady Grove Church, which is now our Grand Prairie campus. Um, and I was there for a day of prayer and fasting, and that's when God spoke to me about planting Gateway Church. And the Lord said, I want Gateway Church to reach all generations, to be a church of all generations. And generations I've heard defined as 40 years or 70 years or 80 years, all sorts of things. But the Lord defined it for me that day uh, differently. And so I'm going to explain that to you and, and, and go into these, these four areas, all right? But we'll do one a week. Um, and it'll all make sense to you. Uh, at the beginning of a series, you have to lay a foundation. So if, you, if you've never preached a series, just in case you ever do, um, you have to lay a foundation. So that's what I'm doing. So the Lord told me about, I want the church to be a, a church that reaches the Abraham generation, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. And he defined it that way to me. And I'm going to show you how he defined it. 
And I wanted just you to think about this. Like this past Christmas, we had those four generations at our home. We had Debbie's mother, her father's uh, already in heaven. We had my father and my mother's in heaven. So we had that generation. We had Debbie and I. We had our grown sons and daughters there and their families and, their, and then their children. So we had children, parents, grandparents, and great-grandparents. Everyone follow me? So I'm, I'm, that's the way I'm defining it, all right? So the Joseph generation for me, and I'll put these on the screen so you can see them, would be under 20. In other words, our children under you. So this is something God said to me. I've never shared this with the church. Never shared this with the church. Uh, I've shared it with our elders and our staff, but never with the church. We were to be a church that focused on the Joseph generation or those under 20, children and youth. And then the Jacob generation would be 20 to 40. Those 20 to 40, starting their families, getting out of college, starting their careers, uh, uh, getting, having, getting going in the teenage years, need a lot of prayer for that time, you know, things like that. And then the Isaac generation be those 40 to 60. Uh, kids beginning to move away from home, get married, becoming empty nesters, things like that. And then the Abraham generation, 60 and older. So everyone follow me? So when I turned 60 a couple of years ago, the Lord told me you're beginning a new season. And he gave me a word for that. And he reminded me of this. And I began to pray then about, well, I wonder if there's a word for the Isaac generation and, and then the Jacob. And this thing started taking off in me. And then at the elders retreat, I was telling the elders, I said, I've got a word. And of course, they all begin with the same letter because that's the way God speaks. We all know that. <laughs> to preachers, that is. So, um, so I've got a word for the Abraham generation, the Isaac and Jacob. And I'm telling the elders this. I said, but I don't have a word for the Joseph generation that would encapsulate what's in my heart. And one of the elders afterward came up and said, hey, I, I have a word I might just to submit to you. And it begins with the same letter. And I want to submit to you, and it's the word identity. So the title of this message is identity. And each week, I'll just take you through one of these. Now, please let me explain that this isn't um, uh, that God only wants to do this when you're under 20, but he would like to, but there are some people in their 50s that still haven't discovered their identity. So, uh, in, in other words, these will cross over age limits, all right? So, um, there's something so in my heart about how the enemy is fighting this under 20 generation with their identity. And so I've got uh, three points for you, all right? Um, and um, the first one is, uh, you have a spiritual war. Now this is no matter what, what age you are. We're in a spiritual war. Ephesians 6 verse 12 says, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. In other words, we don't wrestle against human beings. So your war is never with a human, whether the person's saved or lost. It's never with a human but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. So the first part of this verse is so important because I'm going to talk about something today that you need to know that I'm not talking about people who have a different belief than I do or than the church does or than we do, okay? I'm not talking about people right now. I'm talking about that the enemy is going after this younger generation and going after their identity. So I want you to think about the identity confusion right now that Satan is trying to put on the younger generation. Uh, and I even want to talk about, but not in, a, in an attacking way, please hear my heart, about people who might believe this but gender confusion. 
If you had told me 20 years ago that someone would be confused about his or her gender, I wouldn't have believed you. That there's no one uh, in, in, a, in a labor and delivery room, there's no one when a baby's born that's confused about that person's gen, uh, a gender. I mean, I don't, I'm not trying to get graphic here, but it's obvious <laughs> what gender that baby is. So think about, I'm not, again, I'm not talking about people. I'm not talking about people who hold this belief. I'm talking about Satan is going after this next generation. And if Satan's going after him, why isn't the church going after this generation? Why aren't we going after them? And this is something that's been on the heart of the elders, and, and we're, I'll be rolling out some things that we're going to be doing financially to be able to reach this generation. But uh, it, it is, it's, it's, it's crazy, you know, that, that, that even behind our backs... And when I say behind our backs, because it, it came as a surprise, we found out that our schools were teaching things that were crazy. I heard this comedian talk about it, so you gotta know that this was a comedian, um, and she was of Indian descent, and she said her six-year-old came home from school and said, Mom, I have to go back and tell them how I identify and what my pronoun is. Well, at six years old, I don't even think they've covered pronouns yet. <laughs> How would a six-year-old know? So now you got to remember, she's a comedian, okay? And she's of Indian descent. She said, you go back and tell them you identify as an Indian and your pronoun is doctor. <laughs> so, that's pretty good. So, so don't get mad at me, okay? I didn't say, I'm just telling you what a comedian said. And I thought it was funny. Because how's a six-year-old know what his pronoun is, you know? And then Debbie showed me this thing on, on uh, Instagram where this guy talked about that his son, you know, decided he wanted to be a pirate. And so they were going to see if the hospital, you know, would cut off one of his hands for a hook and would cut off a leg for a peg leg, you know? Well, that's how crazy it is. Some of the things being said, what if the next week he wants to be a surgeon? What if he wants to be a cowboy? What if he wants to, what if he wants to, what if he sees Dak, Press throw a, Dak Prescott throw a touchdown? He wants to be a, dear God, we pray for the cowboys right now. <laughs> I'm joking, but I'm serious, Lord, I pray. Okay. How does a six-year-old know what he wants to be? I'm just simply saying there's a war that's going on against our children today. And if anyone should be helping them discover their identity, and if you wanna just know the bottom line is that their identity is that they were created with, with certain inalienable rights by their creator, they were created equal, they were endowed with these rights, and they are children of God if they'll believe in Jesus Christ. That's their identity. We, uh, we, I'm talking about, you know, six-year-olds. And uh, so one of our grandchildren is six. And when he was right about a month before he turned six, he, uh, Elaine picked him up at kindergarten along with the rest of the kids. And on the way home, he starts crying. And uh, he said, and uh, Elaine said, hey, buddy, what's wrong? And he said, you missed my birthday. And this was about three weeks or so, three to four weeks before his birthday. And she said, no, your birthday's not until next month. He said, no, my birthday was today. And you missed it. And she, you know, so she had to talk to him and talk him through that. And a few weeks later, they had his birthday. And she said, now, do you understand that today's your birthday? He said, yes. And about a month later, though, she picked him up to school and he's crying. And she said, what are you crying about? He said, you missed my birthday. <laughs> and she said, you had your birthday last month. He said, yeah, but I had another one today. He's had nine birthdays this year. <laughs> Last year he had nine. Okay. I'm simply saying, I mean, we, 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 don't, we don't let our children vote 
uh, until they're 18. We don't let them drive until they're 16. We don't let them drink until they're 21. Why would we let them make a decision that could mutilate their bodies for the rest of their lives? That's, that's, why, that's why we have parents. So there, I just want you to know, point one is, you have a, a spiritual war. There's a war going on, no matter what age you are. Here's point two. You have a spiritual purpose. You have a spiritual purpose. Romans 1.1, 1, 1, Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle and set apart for the gospel of God. Now, just let's read it again. Paul, a servant, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle and set apart to the gospel of God. Let me, let me just put it this way. He's, what he's saying is, what I am is a servant of Jesus. What I am, a servant of Jesus. Look, look I'm going to put it on, let's put that on the screen there. What I am is a servant of Jesus. What I do is I'm called to be an apostle, and how I do it is I preach the gospel. See, what we all are, we're all servants, but he had a purpose, and his purpose was to be an apostle. And then he told us how he did it. it, it it's so simple. Uh, my, I'll tell you what my purpose is. I know what my purpose is. And God told me this years ago. My purpose is to help people know God by teaching the Bible. That's how simple it is. I teach the Bible. That's what I do. I teach the Bible. Um, it is so uh, important to me that I say no to a lot of things so that when I stand up here, you get the Bible in a way you can understand it. And I've actually taken criticism over the years because, you know, Pastor Robert doesn't come to this thing and he doesn't come to this thing and, you know, he doesn't do this, he doesn't do that. And he, yeah. The reason is, you don't, some of you may not realize, I spend 20 to 25 hours on every message, plus leading a church this size, plus being a leader in the body of Christ. So I know that if you're not going to get a message that I just threw together in a couple of hours, it's going to take a long time. The other thing is, I'm not putting down a pastor who doesn't spend as much time because a lot of pastors, um, they have to marry everyone, bury everyone, counsel everyone, visit everyone, so they don't have time. So there, there are thousands, and we know this for a fact, thousands of pastors that use my outlines. I'm glad they do. I, I'm like their research assistant. It's fantastic. But this is something God's called me to do because I know my purpose it keeps me on track. I, I say no to some things. I, I've worked on my purpose. I've worked on gestures. I've, I've watched myself. I learn. I, I have jokes timed out in my sermons to keep you from falling asleep. Your attention span, <laughs> if you didn't know it, is four minutes and 30 seconds. And I know that. And so... I, I have worked on this craft, this gift that God's given me, this skill to be able to do what I do. And it's not just Gateway Church, but there are millions of people that are going to hear this message in every country in the world. I mean, it's, Debbie and I were flipping through the channels a while back, and, and there I was, you know, I'm on 67 times a week on 11 different networks. And I just said to her, isn't it amazing that right now, right now, I'm preaching in every nation in the world, right now, right now. So, so I've, my, your purpose keeps you on track, and then you get better at your purpose, and you work on your purpose. Like when I was young, you know, I, I, I like titles that are catchy, and I uh, was preaching at a men's deal one time, and I came up with this catchy title, um, and I've, I've never done it again. I've never used this title again. And I'll tell you why in a minute. I came, because I'm telling men their responsibility according to the Bible. And I, I, the, the title of the message was, It's Not Your Wife's Fault. 
And basically, I was saying, quit blaming your wife. You have responsibility in your home. And if you do what you're supposed to do, God will take care of her, you know? It's not your wife's fault. Well, I, I, Debbie was saying, what are you preaching at the men's conference? I said, I'm preaching it's not your wife's fault. She said, I like this title. <laughs> she said, tell me your message. And so I go over my message a lot with her, and so I was going over it and, you know, things like that. Well, a few weeks later, at that time, I was driving a truck, and Debbie had used it the day before to go pick up some uh, piece of furniture or something and put it in the back. Well, I get in the truck, and as soon as I get in it, it's, it starts dinging at me that it's out of gas, you know? And so I'm going to the gas station. I get about a block from the gas station, and it runs out. <laughs> so these men actually were, got out and helped me push the truck up, you know, to the gas station and up a hill, I'm my dad. <clears throat> but um, anyway, uh, we get the truck. We get it filled up with gas. I got home, and I said to her, um, did, was the truck uh, beeping at you yesterday when you were driving? She said, yeah, the whole way. So, did it ever enter your mind to, you know, put some gas in? I said, I ran out of gas today. You know what she said? It's not your wife's fault. <laughs> so, I'd never use that sermon title again. It's a horrible sermon title. I would, not, I, would, I would not do that if I were you. The point is, I know what my purpose is. My purpose is to teach the Bible. The whole reason I use humor and illustrations is so that you'll hear the Bible because that's what will change your life. So you, you have a, a war and you have a purpose, and here's number three, you have a spiritual identity. You have a spiritual war, you have a spiritual purpose, and you have a spiritual identity. Now, as I, I said um, uh, Elaine preached on David, and this is before I even knew this, but I want, I'm going to use David as a backdrop, you know, throughout this message. When he's fighting Goliath, 1 Samuel 17, verse 32, David said to Saul, let no one lose heart on account of this Philistine. Your servant will go and fight him. Saul replied, you are not able to go out against this Philistine and fight him. You are only a young man. I'm trying, I'm, I want to encourage you if you're only a young man or a young woman. This is David. Most theologians believe he was 17 when he fought Goliath. 17. In verse 42, when the Philistine looked about and saw David, he disdained him because he was only a youth. Okay. How did David kill this giant? Well, Yes, he did some practical things. He learned how to use a sling. That's practical. But how did he have the confidence? Well, if you know anything about David, he was a worshiper. And before, before he fought Goliath, he was a worshiper. As a matter of fact, that was chapter 17. In, verse six, in chapter 16 of 1 Samuel, verse 16, it says, Let us find a good musician to play the harp that whenever the tormenting spirit troubles you, that's Saul, there was an evil spirit, a tormenting spirit troubling him, he, well, the good musician, will play soothing music and you will soon be well again. So how did they know that this probably 15 to 16-year-old then was such a good worshiper? Because when they passed the field, they'd hear him worshiping. So how did David come to know the Lord is my fortress and my rock, a strong tower in whom I trust. How did David know that? Because he entered the presence of God. I'm just giving you a, a, a key to knowing your identity, no matter what age you are, but especially if you're a young person, don't let anyone look down on your youth because God has a purpose for you. But the first purpose for you is to understand your identity, and your identity is in Christ. But the only way you're going to know that is to get into his word and his presence. 
And the more you get into his word and his presence, the more you're going to understand that when a, a giant comes at you, you're going to say, you come at me with a sword and a spear, but I come at you in the name of the Lord God of Israel. And you'll be able to defeat any giant that comes against you because you've been spending time with the giant slayer. <laughs> New Testament says it this way, 1 Timothy 4.12, don't let anyone look down on you because you're young. Don't let anyone look down. I, I want to say to all of our young people, you're important at Gateway Church. You've always been important at Gateway Church. God spoke to us from the very beginning when I was the only one in that prayer center. There weren't any elders, there weren't any staff, there was no one else. I was the only one in that prayer center when God said, I want you to plant a church and call it Gateway Church. And he said that I want it to be a church that ministers to all generations. To those over 60, to those 40 to 60, to those 20 to 40, and to those under 20. It's amazing to me that the last two speakers that have stood in this, the last in the two out of three that have stood in this pulpit have spoken, I mean guest speakers, so they, these two spoke about the next generation. And I got a little clip here, it's less than a minute, but last weekend, if you didn't hear Sammy Rodriguez, he spoke, just part of his message was almost the same wording that back in December, Jensen Franklin spoke. And by the way, I want to commend you on something. You know, one week we had, in, in December, we had Max Lucado, and the next week we had Jensen Franklin. And if you couldn't tell, they're from different backgrounds. <laughs> but I'll never put someone in the pulpit that I don't know. I've known them both personally for years. And I know they're men of God. And, and Max has this kind of, um, he has a delivery that might be familiar to the delivery of the pastor where you used to attend church or grew up with. And Jensen has a delivery that might be familiar to the one where you grew up with or you attended. But what I love about Gateway Church is we're not looking at the package, we're listening to the Holy Spirit. And I just wanna commend you for that. Don't, don't, don't ever dismiss the person or think about the, the wonderful women of God that we've had even this last week at first, Lisa Harper. Don't ever dismiss the package because of age, ethnicity, or gender, ever, ever because God has something to say to us. So I just wanna show you a clip of, of, of Jensen. Now we're getting right into the, I'm just showing you a clip so you gotta understand they're both really wound up when they're saying this and we're jumping in so don't, don't let that bother you, right? So they're wound up but I want you to listen to the Holy Spirit. This is what the Holy Spirit was saying to Gateway through the last two guest speakers that were here. So watch this. This can't be happening to our home because it's time for the church to get loud again. It's time for the church to say, Satan, you can't have my family. You can't have my marriage. You can't have my children. But I heard the Lord say in my spirit to believe for a 10,000 soul teenage youth revival your sons will be there your daughters your i don't know how god's gonna do it generation z will not be the lost generation your children will not go to hell your children and your children's children will have an encounter with the risen savior our children will be saved Let's believe God for our children, our children's children, wherever, whatever age you are, let's believe God. And Jensen said, the Lord spoke to me. This for Gateway Church. Uh, 10,000 souls 
in 2024. 10,000 souls. With, 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 the, with the influence and the reach that we have with not just our campuses, but online and through television, we could see 10,000 young people come to Christ. So I want you to believe with me. But I just want to share just a personal illustration about identity. I got saved at 19, and at 20 years old, I, I, it had not been quite a full year since I got saved. It had been 10 months. I was already preaching in larger churches and things, and I joined the staff of James Robison, who's one of our apostolic elders, who was preaching crusades. Uh, if you, you, you see him now on television, James and Betty, and they do a lot of help, uh, help with nations, uh, drilling water wells and feeding and things like that. Before that, though, he was doing a lot of large crusades, like Billy Graham. And um, so I would go in and do school assemblies and, and invite kids to the crusades. And I would do funny school assemblies, but I would talk about drugs, alcohol, morality, things like that, not about uh, Christ. But, and then I would meet with the athletes and cheerleaders and talk to them about coming and inviting the whole school. And we would have a lot of teenagers come to the crusades. And then pretty soon I was speaking in crusades myself when I was 20, 21, 22 years old, you know. And, uh, I, but I was given the title of associate evangelist with James Robison. And again, if you don't, if you didn't know he was in that crusade era, it'd be like associate evangelist with Billy Graham, you know. So to be in, in your early 20s and be given that title, uh, it kind of went to my head, you know. And to go into, you know, coliseums, you know, 10,000 seat coliseums in your early 20s and they're packed, you know, it started going to my head. And uh, so when I was 25, I had to step out of ministry and get some things straight in my life. And of course, one of the things, the root was, was pride, you know. Um, but the, what I did was I, I went back to James's ministry and became the morning supervisor of the prayer center from 5 a.m. until 2 p.m. I didn't even know 5 a.m. existed before that. <laughs> um, and that's when I had to be at work. I had to be there before that, you know. Um, but over the whole, uh, the prayer center, but over some other areas also was James's son-in-law, Terry Redman. And so on Sunday mornings, we, people would come, volunteers would come, because James was, main, was owned all during the week, but Sunday mornings was a big time. And we would answer the phones and pray for people. And so toward the end of it, Terry was beside me and I was there, other people, you know. And this lady said to me on the phone, your voice sounds familiar. And um, she said, I feel like I, I've heard your voice somewhere. Um, she said, are, are you a preacher or, you know. And so I said to her, well, I am, I'm an associate evangelist with uh, James. And she said, oh, yes, I've heard you preach, and I've seen you on his program. And so when I hung up, Terry had taken his phone off the hook, which like if you had to go to the bathroom or take a break, and then it would just go to another phone, and someone else would answer the call. And he said, hey, take your phone off the hook for me, and I want to ask you something. And so I said, okay. And so he said, why did you tell that lady that you were an associate evangelist with James? And I said, well, you know, when I, when I left, you know, staff uh, here, James told me I could, you know, continue to use that title. And, you know, he said, no, no, I, I understand. He said, I'm not talking about the validity of the title. I, I understand you still have that title. I'm wondering, why did you feel the need? See, you need brothers and sisters in your life. <laughs> this is what church is about. He said, why did you feel the need to tell her you were an associate evangelist with James? And I said, well, she, you know, she said she recognized my voice and all. And I said, I guess I just thought it would, would bless her, you know. And uh, then I said, you know, Jane, uh, Terry is James Robson's son-in-law. And so I said, don't you ever tell anyone that calls in that you're James's son-in-law? And Terry said, no. And I said, well, don't you think it would, would bless them? Like, to know that they actually were talking James Robison's 
son-in-law? And Terry said to me, well, then they're being blessed for the wrong reason. And he said, if my prayer doesn't bless them, then something's wrong in my life. But in me being related to someone who's famous blesses them, that's the wrong reason. And he said, Robert, I'm, I'm proud of you that, you know, you stepped out of ministry to get these areas of your life straight. But he said, I think God wants to take you back to that motel room when you got saved before you were an associate evangelist for James Robinson. And he wants to teach you that you're a child of God. And that's the highest calling you could ever have. And I've never forgotten that. And to this day, it doesn't matter how many people I preach to. It doesn't matter a new book or anything like that. I'm a Christian, and you're a Christian, and I'm just trying to show you some things that the Lord has shown me to help you. My identity is that I'm a child of God. You have to get this in your life, no matter what age you are. But he'd like to get this in your life when you are young, like David. Let me just tell you one more thing about David, just to shock you. You ever read the book of Psalms? Do you know what the word Psalms means? Psalms. Psalms. Who wrote most of the Psalms? Not all, but who wrote most of them? David. Did you know that some of the Psalms were written when David was 11 to 14 years old? I want to say to our young people, don't let anyone look down on you because you're young. Because God has a purpose for your life. I want you to bow your heads and close your eyes. Thank you. I want you to just do like we do every weekend and just say, Holy Spirit, what are you saying to me? And again, I'm in that Abraham generation. But I still have to know that my identity is not in what I do. It's in who I am. And who I am, like Paul said, is a servant of Jesus Christ. I may be called to be an apostle or to be a prophet or to be a teacher or something like that, but who I am is a servant of Jesus Christ. So what's God saying to you? Let's at the beginning of the year put our identity back in being children of God. And let's, as a church, take these next 21 days and pray for our children and youth. Let's go to war because Satan's going after him. So we're going to go after him. Lord, I want to tell you, thank you. Thank you. When I was 19 years old, you changed my life in that motel room. And I'm so grateful, God. And Lord, I want to come in agreement with this word that you spoke through your servant, Jensen. Lord, will you give us at Gateway Church this year 10,000 teenagers come to Christ, come home, get on fire for God, however you want to do it. Lord, we pray for a revival. Our nation needs a revival. And wouldn't it be great if it started with the Davids at 17 and 11 and 14 and the Josephs who got a dream when he was 17 and the Marys who got pregnant with Jesus many believe when she was 14 years old Lord we pray that you'll do something in the next generation 
and the next and the next and in our generation. In Jesus' name, amen.